So, um, Brian's going to talk about some really cool things and things that can really help your operation. So, Brian, a good friend and your mentor, come on up. Hi. Um, so, I was excited when Bill asked me to speak because I do like to share. And I feel like it'd be a shame if I kept all of this information or hard, not hard learning I did to myself. And uh, so we started out with soil. Why do we even care? I look at some of the neighbors, uh, you know, or, or folks around the uh, farmland that I'm surrounded by, and sometimes you wonder if people do care. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, I would say, erosion issues in our part of the country. Exposes soil, and I realize there's a lot of good reasons for tillage. I, I'm not going to fault that, but in my world, that seemed to be uh, one of the driving forces that got me started down this path. Uh, family started no tilling in the mid '90s, and uh, realized that that was sure better than tilling up rocks because our part of the hills has a few rocks and heavy clay. Much different than, than here, of course, with the sandy soils, but we all have our challenges. We all have to learn and adapt. And I think the biggest thing I want uh, folks to take away from what I'm going to explain is, is more about decision-making and less about practices. Um, so, uh, soil, why do, we, why do we care? There's there's a picture here of a plant and some, some roots. And at first this seems like a pretty good deal, but it doesn't have any friends. You know, there's no, no plants next to it. It's out there by its lonesome. Uh, it looks kind of like a sterile situation. You know, there's, there's not a lot of interaction between other plants. So uh, we, we want interaction. We want uh, things to work together, just like our communities, right? got started on my journey, uh, close to 2003, 2004, uh, I was influenced by a man named Terry Gompert. Uh, he was with Knox County Extension. He sent out a newsletter, and I started reading these newsletters. And I was fortunate enough to grow up with a father who was very open-minded to working with nature, and then uh, being influenced by Terry, and also, having limited pasture, I thought getting livestock on the land might be a good idea. Uh, it would extend my grazing for the year. It would reduce the amount of hay I was needing to feed. And little did I know I was going to actually improve my soil by doing it. So that was a cool side benefit I learned later, and probably not right away, but the forage sorghum I have here for the cows, uh, such a fibrous root system that it really does work on a whole lot more soil than some other crops. And I've seen some really good benefits from grazing the forage sorghum. Uh, just getting the livestock back on the crop ground has really changed what I do. In 2015, uh, my dad and I were out looking at some rye or triticale, I don't remember what they planted. Uh, the worm castings on top of the ground were so plentiful, I thought we should take a sample of that and see what kind of value is in those castings. So underneath the castings, I, we t also took a core sample. So you can see that there is some major differences in the casting compared to the sample. Obviously, if it goes through a worm, certainly it's going to be better, right? Uh, but those were much larger values than I expected. And, you know, larger organic matter, a few were less. But the point I'm trying to make here is I couldn't afford to let that blow away. 
because it's sitting at the top of the soil. It's very, very fragile area. I couldn't let it wash away, and I didn't want to let it blow away. How am I supposed to protect that? Well, I could till it in. That didn't sound like a great deal with all my rocks I was dealing with. And it's hard on equipment. So I just kept planting. And I'm using roots to protect plants and roots to protect those things. But the other point I want to make is I've got a workforce because I planted a seed. Those worms were not going to be there had I not planted a seed. It was because of a decision that I have nutrients available. I wouldn't say for free, but because I made a decision. So teamwork. I have lots of pictures, folks, so I hope that's okay. The end of the day, or sliding into the end here, uh, who's that guy that paints trees, happy trees? That's Bob Ross, that's right. So if Bob Ross painted grass, he'd be painting this grass right here. See, the grass next door, and this is in the spring of this year, the, the grass, it, it's buddies over here, they just wish they had a friend like that alfalfa plant. I want to be that grass. I want to have friends like that. So that alfalfa is there because I had rolled out some hay that had to have happened to have some alfalfa seed in it. Am I too loud back there? All good? Okay. That seems like a very simple thing. I didn't have to buy that seed. Maybe I should do more of that. So I do occasionally use some hay, and I don't mind using mature hay because I sometimes get, get results like this. A lot of our pastures tend to be grown because of the way we've managed over the years, and so that has been part of the challenge as well to get a warm season grass in these pastures because pretty soon those cool season pastures dry up we need something more resilient than just a small window like that. But teamwork, so I'm starting to think about relationships between different plants and how can I use that to my advantage. So teamwork, companions, this isn't new. I call it old school technology. These are forage peas, 40-10 forage peas, and oats. So these are both seeds that I grow for sell, for uh, selling to uh, local producers. Um, they are both public varieties. So I, I should also mention that I do grow seed, cover crop seed. We all saw the video earlier that was hairy vetch that I was harvesting. But the oats and peas has been a whole lot of fun. It does fill a niche earlier in the year. And uh, I end up growing these, growing this crop to graze with some yearlings. This was another way of me getting cattle on the land, depositing manure that I didn't have to haul out of the lot. I think we sold our manure spreader 15 years ago. I don't think we even spread manure maybe once since then because we rented it back from the guy we sold it to just for that day. So I've really enjoyed not hauling manure. That's been a real blessing and a money saver in my world because I got cattle back out of the doing things like this. And this is with no fertilizer. So that's just friends doing their job together, companions, loving life, and then I make beef out of it.
So we talked about Harry Vetch. Um, you can see the nodules on the roots. That vetch isn't very old, but it's doing its job making nutrients for me. I can really consistently grow a forage crop after a lagoon with little to no inputs. So when it comes to growing corn and other crops of that nature, I'm not saying that I need to go cold turkey, but when I can grow a forage crop after a lagoon, that starts to make a lot of sense to me. Produce my own nutrients. The beautiful thing about hairy veg is it makes this great thatch, this great soil protector, at least uh, gives me a little window of weed protection when I follow it up with something else. And we'll see another picture here in just a little bit about how I'm doing that. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out is um, it's hard to see without a comparison, but the tilth of that soil is much different than when it started. There's, to me, that's life. There's um, structure, and I soak in a lot of rain. And that's the other beautiful part about, um, about the, the residue that's left over. When the raindrop hits, it goes down. Just like Dell was talking about his infiltration rates. Um, there just is not an opportunity for it to run off because the soil's already pulling it down. So it's about keeping what comes. The other thing that I, I noticed in 21, this is the end of January in 2021, now up to this point, it had been on the warmer side. But you can see there's snow in those stalks. I wouldn't imagine there'd be worms there unless they had something to eat or felt protected. So that spoke a lot to me, that I had that kind of worm activity and there's snow on the ground. And the vetch is green. That year I had cows out on this piece and uh, was able to graze through the winter. It was a beautiful mix of dry and green. And that vetch, they licked up like candy and uh, kept some cows pretty fat through that winter. I just couldn't believe there was other kind of worms. I was just blown away. But there was living roots because of the vetch. Um, competition. I really like the idea of using plants to compete against other plants. Right here is this spring, or I should say summer. Uh, this is a field of rye. You can see a strip right here. Um, clearly that's where I missed a little skip when I was planting last fall. Uh, this was following grain sorghum. And this rye only made 15 bushel this year, L1 rye. It wasn't a great yield. But I decided to take it to seed anyway. And I was impressed with even at the thin stand, I still had good weed control up to harvest. I was really blown away by how much it held the other plants back. And you can see the green, that's a, a bit of the, the green sort of coming through just uh, from what had come out of the back of the combine from the year before, because so we've been so dry that that seed was viable this spring. So I really like the idea of using plants to compete against other plants. Um, and in fact, in this field, at boot stage, 
I planted mung beans. Now the, the rye was about this tall, and I ran over it with the drill. I got that idea because I've done some rolling of rye, and sometimes it likes to stand up if you don't roll at the right time. Well, shoot, why won't it stand back up if I just run over it with the drill, right? So it stood back up and uh, planted soybeans. So you can see in this corner, it's kind of a tough picture, but there's green underneath. Those are soybeans, or those are mung beans growing. Now, of course, after I harvested, we haven't got much rain, so they're probably not going to do anything this year. But the cows will have something to eat. So that's the other beauty of having livestock, because you can transition from a potential seed crop to now a very high protein winter feed. The mung bean actually holds its value, or holds the seed in the pod for quite a while. It doesn't shell out like some other crops will. And I've grazed them before, and the cows really slicked up. Um, and it, the mung bean can be over 20% protein, and it's, it's very usable. It's not like a soybean that has to be roasted. It's a readily used protein. And the mung bean is, I would say, the milo of the bean world. It's, it's on the drought tolerant side versus it eating a soybean. So I'm getting, I'm not getting what I wanted out of this field. I have 15 bushel rye. I might get a seed crop of mung beans, but at least I'm going to get a grazing crop and a rye seed crop. So more companions, more friends doing their work together. This is a field of oats. I didn't plant the oats by itself. I planted a mix of alfalfa, orchard grass, some grapeseed, other orbs, and a few other uh, cool season grasses. The oats were a nurse crop. Again, this is not new technology. How many years have you heard of guys using oats as a nurse crop? This is something very common. But again, I did, I did apply some lime to this farm because it was, I was concerned about having the right pH for the lagoons. But I didn't use any nitrogen on this farm. I didn't want to outcompete the alfalfa. My, my focus really wasn't on the oats, but I did take a crop of oats for seed. It made 55 bushel. Now, if you ever planted oats, you know some, in our part of the world, sometimes it can be over 100 bushel oats. So is that a great deal? No. But did I spend much on it? No. That was seed that I had grown and uh, cleaned myself. And uh, underneath it, I've got a grazing crop. So that crop of alfalfa, orchard grass, and other forbs that'll be grazed uh, with the cows this winter. Now, I did take the oats off and was hoping everything would just explode once it hit sunlight. But it was so hot and windy that it's really not done anything since that time. It just kind of sat there. But it's established, and it was established in a wetter part of the year versus trying to start it now in August. Um, so at least I have a, a field in transition to pasture. This is only 15 acres. This is not a large piece. But I just want to echo what, what Nate was talking about earlier, is start with a small piece, figure it out. You don't have a big investment in it. If it goes south, you chalk it up to experience and move on. But this worked out really great. And as soon as we do get rain, it's ready. The solar panel's there. So I'm really excited about what it can do once we get some cooler temps and just a little bit of moisture. It's just going to explode. And if there's any oats off the back of the combine, it's going to grow this fall too. So 
get, getting multiple benefits out of the same planting. Actually, I should say this was planted twice. I planted the oats separately from, from the other seeds because I just had one green drill. I didn't have a separate seed box. So protect your moisture. It doesn't matter how much moisture you get, it's how much you keep. What do you retain? This is a picture of buckwheat up in the top. I had planted buckwheat into this vetch residue. This is 45 days after planting with no moisture, no rain. I was really surprised when I pulled back the residue. Most of the field, uh, you can lose your cell phone in the cracks because our clay soils will just crack. And uh, when I pulled the residue back, the first layer, a lot of worm castings on the top, a lot of aggregates. And then you pull back that first half inch layer of soil and there was moisture. That's the only reason that those plants came up. I was able to slice it in, get it into moisture. And you could grow it uh, just a few days after planting. Now the stand isn't that great on this particular field. We have not, we have received a rain since. We'll see what happens. So I want a seed crop. That's what my intention was. I want to be able to take buckwheat as a seed crop. But worst case scenario, I get some phosphate released through mineralization. So even if I don't get a seed crop, it's not money in my pocket, but it is working on the next crop release. So we're getting multiple benefits out of one plant. And if buckwheat does get some moisture, if, it is, if this field does get some moisture, I'll get some good weed control as well. So I had the pleasure of going to Arkansas this summer, and there was an event put on by Green America. Uh, Dan Kittredge was there, and he's the founder and executive director of Bionutrient Food Association. And he's been working on some very interesting things, and one of them is nutrient density in our food supply. So we talk about why we care about soil. This is a big one. This is really interesting to me. So Heath has found, through studying lots of different vegetables, fruits, that there is a significant variation in our food supply. And the really interesting part is, it doesn't matter if it's organic, local, what part of the country it came from, or even the price. So you can go to Safeway over here, pick out the most expensive piece of fruit, and it may be no better or worse than the least expensive. So that doesn't give the consumer much confidence in what they're feeding their kids or themselves. He is right now leading a study in beef. So he's working on the density of grass finished beef, conventional feedlot situations, um, how the animal is grazed, a lot of dis different scenarios. So they're trying to nail down what type of nutrient density or what type of systems might bring the most value in the nutrient density realm. So, all very interesting there. And then this is also a chart from the Bionutrient Food Association. So we talked about how it's really, a, there's very little indication on nutrient density. He says it all comes down to the way the soil is managed. 
that's the only way we can tell if there is going to be better nutrient density. And when I say the way it's managed, using systems that keep the soil protected and keep carbon pumping into the soil with live roots as much as possible. So to properly understand this chart, we're going to look at, oh, uh, let's look at the big one, grapes. That's easy for everyone to see. It gets very small up here. So a grape, they took grapes of all different price ranges, management systems, whatever. So you have a low range on nutrient density and you have a high range, so very high nutrient dense grapes. It takes 15 of the very low nutrient dense grapes to equal one of the high nutrient dense grapes. So that's how you read this chart. You would have to eat nine beets to reach the level of the high nutrient dense beet. Eight blueberries, six potatoes, and this is just from supermarket shelves. This is where they were getting this produce. Five squash. I don't like eating that much, that many beets. I like beets, but not that many. So we start wondering why we're having some of our health problems. This might be an indicator. I'm not the expert on this, but it doesn't look promising when we have to eat multiples to get the same nutrients we need out of one. I mentioned that I clean seed, uh, sell seed, grow seed. Um, this is part of what I do. Uh, here's a picture of mung beans that I've been experimenting with. Um, some triticale and hairy vetch that I planted together. I do like planting things together, but it does give a lot of complications separating. So there's a lot of variations here, but um, the experimentation is, is fun, and especially if they can benefit each other when they grow. Uh, and then I bought an air cleaner and then a, a scalper, so I can do a good job of, of, of a good clean sample. And those things have allowed me to experiment safely without as much risk. Yes, those things cost those things were not cheap. But it gives me more opportunities to try different combinations without having to search for someone else to clean. And there's a lot of experimentation that happens on my place and a lot of sorting out, well, should I use this screen or that screen? So it's not easy work. Um, but I can't imagine paying someone else to do it. And so this gives me a lot of options when it comes to trying different things. And so uh, it's been a blessing in that way. And the other part about it is um, I do clean seed for, for neighbors. And I, I will mention that on the community piece. Uh, I get to see my neighbors this way. You don't always get to see your neighbors if you're so busy doing other work. And I worked a job for 20 years in town uh, while I was building the farm or my operation. I recently quit that job and went full throttle into full-time farming. Um, and it's pretty exciting. But during that time, you, you work in town and then you go home and, and have family time, do some church time, and then farm on the side a little bit. That eats up all your time and you don't see your neighbors. That doesn't seem like a life. So this does give me opportunity to meet some people that are like-minded and are willing to try new things. And it's something that I can help my neighbors through this. And that, that's uh, really fulfilling. So 
so this is just uh, some of the things I'm trying, doing, um, maybe not doing very well. <laughs> you can see the diversity of what I, I got seed over here, rye, mung beans, oats, hairy veg, orchids, buckwheat. Those are some main ones I'm doing lately. Um, and then there's different categories. You can read them. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, even uh, at least out a little bit of hunting. So I'm, I'm trying to bring value to the farm through different revenues, through, through different lines. Uh, it's not just going to be cows or yearlings or mung beans. Uh, trying to spread the risk. But I also don't want to get too spread out either. This seems really busy to me. I would really like to just grow one thing or two things. This is really busy. Don't let that scare you. It, the, the, uh, I did add some pigs. We'll show a slide later. Um, and the honey, I don't do that myself. I got, I got a bee guy. He comes in with, with his bees. So, and the, the hunting, that's not hard because I'm just providing a place for someone to do what they love. But I get a little bit of revenue that helps keep the fences fixed, you know. So uh, I do enjoy the cow piece a lot, and uh, I do enjoy bringing the yearlings in. I will use the yearlings uh, just an example. Uh, for the last several years, I was bringing in about a hundred head of, of uh, heifers, just yearling heifers. And I'm rolling hay out on cropland. And because there's such value in, in the manure and even the wasted hay, uh, you hate to think of hay as being wasted when it's going back into the ground. Um, and I probably waste, I probably put more hay in the ground than I was hoping for, especially if we could get a big snow. But I'd roll hay out in Winrow and I'll run those yearlings across it and give them a, a day's worth with a reel and wire. And we're seeing some real fun results on, uh, for example, soybean yields in the 70 bushel range, uh, where the rest of the field was in the 45, 50 bushel range. So that was just because of the impact of the animals. And if you would have looked at the field, even during rain events, and said, what are you doing out there? You are compacting that. There's a lot of folks who feel that the cow does some major compaction issue issues on the crop ground. And I'm dealing with heavy clay. If there was going to be compaction, I would think that would be the place. I'm not seeing that kind of problem in my operation. So there is something, there might be surface compaction and we're no-tilling at all. And I'm running over piles, you know, piles of hay that maybe didn't get spread out. It's ugly. No one wants to put that by the highway, right? But it's yielding. And I didn't have to disc it in or any of that at James. You just let the cows do their work. Plus they like seeing you every day when you want to give them something new to eat. When I mentioned the hogs earlier, number one, my, my, my dad and my grandpa were both in the seed cream business. Uh, before Round of Ready soybeans came out, and that kind of put the kibosh to that. Uh, they did oats and wheat also. I never thought that I would clean seed. I spent a lot of time helping, and I'm sure my back isn't as good as it should be because of that. Handling 50 pound bags and sewing that up. And I never thought that I'd have hogs. <laughs> but I've got this resource with seed cleanings that started making sense. Well, I could try growing that through a cow, but you know, there's some weed seeds and other chaff. You know, my neighbor has a, a grinder, grinder mixer. I'll just rent that from him. So I took a uh, feed test, and it was 
my seed cleans were about 16% protein, so I just buy some soybean meal from the local co-op and I mix that in and the pigs, they do just fine on it. Uh, and of course they get all the other scraps. You know, I only had five head. Is that worth messing with? I have some pretty good bacon in my freezer. And I like pork chops. So that gives me a little pleasure. And I get to sell some to some other neighbors. And now I'm building more community around something that they feel or they have value in. It's like, oh, I, I can know a guy with some pork. And they tell their neighbor, hey, talk to Brian. He can get you some good pork chops. So I've had fun doing that. We talked a little bit about community. I don't have a big farm. I do enjoy the neighbors. I've got some great neighbors um, that are willing to come move cattle with me. These are those yearlings I was talking about. Uh, we were just moving across pasture. I don't own a horse, but I have people that do. I don't own any bees, but I have people that do. I don't own a semi, but I got people that do. And I'm willing to pay them well for it. Now these folks, their payment comes just in the satisfaction of being able to move a herd of cows or yearlings. They don't get to do that in my country. This isn't normal, or, or that common, I should say. So they get to have practice with their horses at my place, and they are more than happy to come and do it. And I also make it right with them. We go out to dinner sometimes, and they think, they think, they think that's me overpaying them, because they had so much fun doing this. So just really trying to involve the community. Um, and, uh, and the semis I use for for uh, summer harvest is usually an off season for my world. Usually corn and soybeans in the fall is where all the equipment is used. And so when I need something like that in the summer, uh, we have plenty of people who are more than willing to let me put their machine in a shed where theirs might even sit outside. But, oh yeah. You bet. Put that in the shed. That's no problem. We'll let you use it. Keep the tires up a little better, right? So, I keep the sun off that machine. So, I, I really try to value the folks that are helping me be successful. Um, making sure that they understand that they are valued. And that I couldn't do it without them. So, Plus, I sure enjoy the camaraderie when I do get to visit with, with those folks. So bottom line, uh, we're using a lot of different tools on the farm, using a lot of different avenues to bring revenue, uh, even though it's not a large operation. But it's, uh, it's been a big, uh, fun journey and we're improving soil at the same time and raising quality products. So that's all I have of the slides and I appreciate you listening. Thank you for having me. Josh. He says they're only maybe a couple months out from having that study finished. So it's not going to be long. So yeah, I'll be interested as well. It, you just, you think you have, you have these notions of what might be quality, but this, when they test like they are, they're really digging in. And one thing I did know, note is Dan has a handheld device 
that he can take to the supermarket, scan a zucchini, and tell you in a few seconds, within three seconds, if that zucchini is nutrient dense or not, or what level it is. So he's, he feels that in the future, we're gonna be able to use our phones and just scan. The person going to the supermarket is gonna decide which apple they want based on what their phone is telling them. So that's gonna be a game changer for how we do food. Any other questions? I have used a refractometer, yeah. That's been a part of my life for, well, since I was a kid. Uh, so I've not used it as much as I want to. Um, so that's that's part of, of what I want to keep doing in the future. So a refractometer is a measurement of the solids within the sap of a, of a plant. Brick. So it's a measure of bricks. Yeah. So it's it's uh, taking the squeezing the sap out of a plant, and it shows the dissolved solids or the sugars within the plant. So the higher amount of dissolved dissolved solids, the higher amount of sugars, the healthier the plant's going to be, and the more resistant to disease and healthier. The plant. You said two or, two or three hundred dollars for one? Yeah. They're pretty inexpensive, is what I'm saying. So when you're So the question was, have, is there any secrets to planting buckwheat? This is my first year. So uh, my secret was, I got out of the tractor and I took a tool and I dug down to make sure it was planted in the right place and it was hidden soil. So that's my secret. I made sure I was getting through the residue. So many times you plant and then there's seed laying on top. Well, that didn't work. So I'm, I'm a real big proponent of that kind of detail. Make sure you planted it into soil, into moisture. I did plant it deeper because I knew I had a moisture issue uh, on uh, parts of the field. So I, I went on the deeper end of where buckwheat should be. I think I was an inch or better where I was placing that seed. I would mention that my bee guy loves me because buckwheat is, I think, the number one producer of honey because there's so many flowers. And I do get a portion of the honey and then I'll use that as gifts, really, to my landlords. And it's always appreciated. No one's ever turned back honey. So, especially local honey, they know where it can be. Vance. You said something about hairy vetch? Oh, has it become a weed? I've never had that problem. Uh, in fact, I've had I've had a fair amount of shelling because by the time you get to the harvest, I think you and I talked a little, uh, it, those bottom pods will shell. And so you're basically planting the next crop. I've, on one of my fields, I've got three, three growths out of one planting. If I planted it, in the fall, harvested it, it regrew from the volunteer, harvested it again, and then it regrew again, and then I just terminated it and planted corn or something into it. So that made sense when you only had to plant one time and you got three growths, three seasons out of it. So it's those little things that don't seem like they're that big. But gosh, all your time and effort in the field, planting, and no seed costs, and you have a, a free plant growing with roots leaking carbon, life is okay. So you can afford to take just a little bit of a yield hit, and you, don't, you just don't have the risk out there. 
I'm not for lower yields. I, I would like to up my yields, but those things start to make sense. I'm not opposed to two or three. In fact, some of my best results um, is following forage sorghum. That's one variety. That's one seed. It's, it's a no-brainer. I plant forage sorghum or some type of sorghum. I'm told that if you graze this sorghum halfway through the season, it'll get angry at you and put down 400% more roots. And they're fibrous already. So it's doing a fantastic amount of leaking of carbon into your soil. So I'm a, I'm a big, and it, it, I really echoes what Dell was doing early on too, and his father. The Forbes sorghum really changed uh, the dynamic of the soil, and it, it makes it mellow. So, in this situation with lighter soils, I, I don't think that's out of the realm for what's been traditional in this area. Am I, am I off? Millets. Yeah. So that's that's in the same line. So you could uh, tailor it to your environment, but uh, also it's that type of risk system, and that's where I've seen a lot of value. Thank you very much.